hope you all enjoy the film. So uh, I want to start asking questions uh, first of Arvind Narayan. Uh, Arvind, so the film ends basically uh, on the December 2013 negative verdict uh, by the Supreme Court. So what was the challenge after that? Uh, uh, I mean, in brief, obviously, uh, how did we basically come up to the September 2018 uh, positive verdict? Uh, you know, I think your film, in a sense, captures what uh, what happened post 2013, which is, I think, what I like about the film is it's partly you're capturing a part of the legal narrative, and equally importantly, you're capturing the narrative of the activism on the street and how the two really come together. You know, and um, and at least my my analysis would be that what was very very important post 2013 was the the kind of public campaign. Which began immediately post that. We had the no going back campaign, which got a, which got a range of groups in opposition to this to the particular law, and I think it had its impact because if you notice, uh, there were more, more. Again, the way to think about this is this. I, th I think in the film, there's a very nice reference by someone who said, you know, end of the day, I think Anjali made the point. End of the day, our point is not that the provision of the law goes. Our point is how does a social attitude and social morality really change, and that can only change if we take it as a social, the campaign against the law, a social legal campaign. You're as much interested in changing society. And the simple point, simple point I'll make is this. What changed in 2013 and 2018 is because the street level protest was activism in homes, activism in families, because people coming out and as you, as you document in large numbers, people saying that, you know, Supreme Court can say what it wants. We're not going back, right? And we're not going back. And that's, I think, what created that kind of a change at a wider level. In 2008, we got a lot of we got a lot of publicity. 2013, we got even more publicity. So though it was a defeat at a legal level, I think it paved the way for a larger victory in 2018. So I, I'll put the the ball back straight in the in the question of the work which is done by people marching on the streets and people protesting and people doing a range of things in many parts of the country, which allowed for that change in 2018. There's many petitions which were filed after the uh, uh, 2013 verdict, you know, uh, which were the prominent ones? Uh, 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 how did it all happen? Arvind? Yeah. The, post the, uh, the 2013 verdict, we filed a, a review petition which got rejected. Then we filed a curative petition. And the curative petition, we got an order saying that five judges of the Supreme Court will hear it. In the meantime, another another red petition filed by Navdeep Singh Dohar and others, uh, a separate red petition, which was listed by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided to take up the 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 red petition by Navdeep Dohar and others as opposed to the, the curative petition. In a sense, it's a strategic point, but a very important one because the curative petition was limited by the it, was, it, was, it would have been only heard by the top three judges of the Supreme Court plus the two judges who heard the review petition. You were limited by who judges could hear it. But as it was fresh review petition. The, 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 the Chief Justice could decide who he wanted to be on the bench since he's the master of the roster. So, the Navtesh Singh Johar, the Chief Justice, obviously the panel of judges was Justice Chandrachur was obviously sympathetic. He read his previous writings. Justice Nariman was very sympathetic. As well as uh, Justice Mishra, we didn't know at that moment in time. Justice Kanwilkar, we, we, we didn't have an idea. Yeah, Justice Indumulata was sympathetic. So, he selected a bench which is obviously very sympathetic to our concerns. You know? So, that, that's, I think the, the, the core part of the answer is we got a bench which is incredibly sympathetic and the petition was moved at the right time. Coming to Ashok, uh, what do you think, like, I mean, uh, basically, um, what is the ground reality for the LGBT community post uh, reading down of uh, Section 377 uh, in terms of uh, uh, after the September 2018 verdict, you know? What do you think has changed compared to what we saw in the film, you know? What has happened is... Uh, uh, pre-Supreme Court judgment, you know, when the, the, the judgment came, first of all, the, the constitutionality of uh, what uh, Justice Singhvi's judgment and how it was sort of uh, uh, the Navtej uh, Singh petition. Now, where, when you look at all of those things, you find that the obsession was with Section 377 to get it out of the way. That was our main intention and it succeeded. The real thing now is open a Pandora's box. Because uh, uh, the issues that are now out there are really practical with our everyday lives. Like uh, same sex, uh, will it be recognized? A surrogacy, uh, even something like uh, blood donation. You know, there's a very clear, NACO has got a very clear this, that if you are in having MSM sex, you cannot give blood. It still is there. 
all these things have to be challenged in court and got out of the way one by one because they'll be tested against the Supreme Court judgment. So we have a much wider scale of social activism. And that's where I'm afraid that we may lose our way. You know, we could get off the track because uh, there are so many issues. We have not been able to prioritize them. We haven't had any more con uh, community consultations after the Supreme Court judgment, you know, that uh, which uh, the lawyers collective used to hold. Uh, and uh, now what is happening is each group is looking at each issue in its own way. And that is leading to a disintegration of the movement, according to me. It's going in various different directions. So what we need is to prioritize what after Section 377. That has not happened. Now, which are the priority areas we want to work in? There are groups like um, uh, they'll be working on uh, inclusion in the workplace and uh, stigma and discrimination in the workplace, stigma and discrimination in academia. All these things are being taken. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, and that I don't know is whether the right way to go to at all. I think we need a concerted effort at sitting down, finding out what is the priority, go for it one by one and go for it in such a way, systematic way. For example, we need to help out on the transgender bill protect protection bill. Uh, how does that align with Section 377 and the Supreme Court judgment? All these sort of things have not been thought of at all. And that's what worries me. Okay, uh, I'll come back to you with some more questions. Uh, yeah. Vivek, uh, just to ask you this question, we basically, in the beginning, we fought on the platform of HIV and AIDS, primarily. The Section 377 fight was basically... On, so. How is that particular aspect post Section 377 reading down? Uh, what has been happening on the HIV AIDS front in terms of intervention and uh, what is the story there? Well, HIV interventions continue as usual. Uh, in fact, uh, if you say that, did more people actually come out? Did they make themselves visible? Did, they come, did more testing happen? Uh, no, I don't think numbers actually went up. Uh, what started happening was that uh, on the sites, whether these were internet sites or these were physical sites, we started noticing uh, because I was hearing someone during the film, I think it was Arvind, I'm not very sure. Someone said that when, you know, when there was violence against LGBTQ, they wouldn't go to the police. After 2018, we have seen a significant rise in number of young LGBTQ who are willing to get up and press charges. And these are people who are coming from the sites. Okay. Why HIV programs have not strengthened? Uh, I think it has got very little to do with the Supreme Court judgment. There are funding issues. There are crises in the HIV, program, not just in India, but all over the world. But I think given the right direction, uh, it will result into more people coming out because one can see that there are more people out there. Like earlier, before 2018, uh, we would normally see about two instances of situation every week. Now we see like up to four. Now these are reported, but we also know that the violence has gone out because for a lot of youngsters, coming out has meant like being on dating apps, being out there, and then getting into these, you know, getting. Uh, like getting into the company of people who just come to your house, blackmail you, loot you. So crisis is being reported much higher. Secondly, crisis situations are happening. But has it led to more HIV tests? So right now, government of India is in this space and we are working with them that instead of physical spaces, we are now getting into, we're developing a virtual outreach program for the community, which we hope will strengthen HIV testing because the kind of target we are taking for one year is something that the government of India prescribes for like say three years. But that would be tested over a period of next three years. So we will come to know post that. Okay. Thank you for sharing those thoughts, Vivek. Uh, Shobna, coming to you. Uh, basically, like, I mean, I know that like uh, earlier you had spoken about when 2009 verdict happened. Um, a lot of uh, uh, even elderly married women came out, you know, uh, yeah. because they were repressed for so long. 
uh, 2000 uh, so nine verdict basically brought them out you know did that yeah. same thing happen post 2018 verdict you know uh, did more elderly uh, 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 lbt women or did you see more lbt persons coming out you know uh there were some but the thing is that you know um uh, because of the politics of the country at the moment it's still conservative so for the people for the women especially who are ma- who are married have kids um it has become an issue of the few that i've met basically it has become an issue in terms of how will they support themselves what happens to the kids um and if there's younger kids involved then you need you know a two parent family or if you're living in an extended family then that becomes an issue as well um so i actually have not i've spoken to a lot of people but i have not seen anybody who have who has successfully sort of come out post marriage um so that is still a barrier at the moment um yeah i haven't seen anybody do that after marriage i mean they still occasionally talk to me call me up uh especially also in this covid 9 19 uh, scenario there's a lot of uh, anxiety involved uh because of the 24/7 and in an enclosed space but uh, for older the older women uh, it becomes an issue uh, and because they're also so used to hiding being a double leading a double life the lockdown upon a lockdown is is becoming <laughs> sort of like a mental mental thing at the moment uh had few cases of anxiety panic attack calls and things like that but the the uh, atmosphere has not been any better i think especially for married women older older women yeah. and what about like i mean also like uh, in terms of querying uh, the book publishing business which you run so have there be more uh, uh, openness in the, about ordering books uh uh watching films post uh, 2018 verdict you know book have you seen I've a rise in business you know yeah <laughs> yeah well until the the lockdown the print business was going quite well <laughs> now i have to convert more than 10 books into digital and it's quite a task and especially as all the digital companies are on lockdown um so the books actually were, were bought mostly by the mainstream um and people of the feedback that i get uh by young university students um i actually have a lot of readers in west bengal for some reason a lot uh, of sales in west bengal west bengal bangalore um and up north somewhere maharashtra not so much um but until now the print books uh were doing quite well and a lot of times the families and friends were also buying I I came to a point where I think I had larger percentage who have identified as family and friends um simply because of the feedback that I used to get on the book um but it is still in demand people still want to read about you know an indian love story about two women about any sexuality or any gender um uh, but it has to be indian within an indian locality uh within indian scenario um so I think yeah The, so far, the print sales have been pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Simran. Uh, how has been the uh, 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 space for the trans community uh, post reading down? Uh, I know that the transgender bill is still uh, uh, hotly debated. Can you throw some light on that uh, after the, uh, the uh, 2018 verdict? What What has been the scene? Oh. Thanks, Sridhar. Uh, first of all, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Sridhar and Sagar, both the teams. Um, I think, um, and this is per- uh, completely my perspective on this. Um, after the reading of uh, Section three seventy seven in twenty eighteen, um, there has been a significant change at the ground level, as terms of transgenders are concerned. Now, these changes can be uh, measured. uh in terms of um hate crimes mm-hmm. uh in terms of um accessing healthcare services uh ac- accessing um uh, self right uh, and dignity and etc but the major part the other side of the coin the major part is there hasn't been any change in the mindset of the so called society um 
and that is something very worry worrying some uh, uh, post the Supreme Court ruling. Um, and this is what my perspective is because unless and until up yahape changes na la pao, so it is very difficult to change the scenario at the ground level. The reason now why why I said there is some significant changes in the hate crime, I think it's because of Section 377 that people have started at least documenting. Kisi hijde ka murder ho gaya, kisi transgender ka murder ho gaya, at least those news are coming. First, we never used to have that data also. Great. Um, you know, so there has been little significant change. But the impact on transgender's life remains the same. Still, people are not accepting. Um, sex work pay, yes, gira kate hai, but koi ghar ni deta hai baju mein rene ke liye. Still, we have to find properties and uh, jobs and uh, uh, so called avenues of sustainability is a struggle for a transgender identified woman. And in fact, even visible koti, effeminate kotis also has to face the same. I mean, I don't differentiate uh, between the entire LGBT spectrum. But since you posted the question on transgender, I'm saying on transgender. But if you see the entire spectrum of LGBT is the same. Even the lesbian woman is still facing the same problem. Halake maniata hai, but yaha pe changes ni hai. This is my purview. And what are the uh, what are the issues with the transgender bill? What is needs to be changed? And I know it's a big Pandora's box, but in short, for people attendees who might not know more about the transgender bill, where are the where are the fight points? What are the things we need to have uh, uh, just consider on that? So right now, the current scenario is the government of India has uh, put it on their website for communities recommendation. And as you clearly raise the five elements, basically the five points that the community are raising. And of course, it's just not the five points It's much beyond that. But at least the five points that we are really asking is actual inclusive definition of transgender umbrella term. Second, what we are asking is actual rights, the property inheritance rights, right to education, vagere vagere. Fourth, what we are asking is right for adoption. Mm -hmm. And fifth, what we are asking is marriage equality rights. Um, those are the five elements from my perspective, from my point of view. But the, the bill, the, the bill which is now con converting into an act uh, is taking that process uh, recommendations from the community. How much will it be considered? It's Bhagwan Jane. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Simran. Uh, Pearl, so basically, we also see a lot more different identities coming up, you know, uh, queer, yeah. uh, non uh, confirming, no, uh, so uh, uh, trans men, uh, there's so many different identities. So, uh, you have been working with them uh, as part of your work. So, you want to talk a little bit about the different identities and the kind of specific issues they face, per se? You know? uh so, okay, when we talk about different identities, even under the trans umbrella, we are always, uh, and this is the majority, like even the trans bill says it, we are only talking about uh, trans women and the hijra community. But if you look at the transgender umbrella itself, it is so diverse. Like you look at trans men, you look at gender non-confirming, gender non-binaries, and it's an endless process. And you cannot say that they have come today. They've always been there. Like how gay has always been there or lesbian has always been there. They've just, you have started recognizing them now. And that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, carry on. Go ahead. Yeah. And also, uh, when you talk about uh, these identities, uh, the first problem that they face is, again, the same that we are also facing is understanding. Understanding to be like, oh, but why are you like this? If you're like this, you should be. A trans man. If you have short hair, you should be a trans man. Or you know, or if you are an effeminate man, you should be a trans woman. It's the same way. It's it's the simple understanding which is lacking, and that leads to so many other issues, uh, like 
I mean, I've been, I've worked with Hamza for, for the past three years, and uh, Vivek sir also knows this. That after the 2018 judgment, we did a study one year post that, and we saw that the number of cases of discrimination had almost doubled. And these are the cases which are registered. But what about those cases which don't even get recognized? Like, say, uh, uh, sorry, uh, say, corrective rape that happens on. Uh, female bodied people mm-hmm. that is not that doesn't come under the law that doesn't get registered that doesn't get uh, look at the uh, you know women who are married and want to get out of that marriage i've handled so many cases under umang for that and it is so difficult for them because most of the uh, lawyers tell them that oh what you are doing is wrong in fact this is after the 2018 judgment i've heard people lawyers telling women that oh but your sexuality is a problem and you will not be able to fight the case against your husband on the basis of your sexuality right um so uh, arvin just to uh, answer to uh, uh, pearl's point has there been more sensitization of lawyers per se uh I have you taken up any projects where you are sensitizing more lawyers to deal with diverse cases you know um any uh, thoughts on that i mean uh, shrida agree with what um, everybody said just now and especially uh, simran's very uh, important comment that um, the law might have changed but society may not necessarily have changed and i think we can go back to the judgment for that i think judgment in terms of two two dimensions of the judgment one is the invocation of constitutional morality both in the nas foundation case as well as in navtej and the idea which ambedkar puts forward which is a very important idea which is what he says is that constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment it has to be cultivated and democracy in india is a top dressing on a soil which is essentially undemocratic and that's essentially what simran is gesturing to saying people's mindsets have not changed we got a wonderful judgment but what's the use of the wonderful judgment if it doesn't translate into something which which affects every person's way of life and again the clue in the judgment you go back to the judgment uh, justice chandrachud's invocation of article 15 152 where he says the the question of equality is also with the stereotypes embedded in the law why are we opposed to 377 we are opposed to 377 because there is a stereotypical perception embedded in it of of of, of of the behavior of lgbt people is animal like and challenging the stereotypes is a more long term process cultivating constitutional morality is a more long term process it's not something which is going to happen today or tomorrow but need, people need to work on it and that's why i think go back to the political question if you look at the i think your film again it's crystal clear who are the people who are opposing us through and through in a political sense it is the bjp in terms of a historical record you put, as 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 you traced it out and today the fact that the, the the bjp has been silent on this is a great disservice they're doing doing to the community and i think we shouldn't be very happy saying oh they didn't oppose us it's not good enough it's 2020 and if you read justice nariman's opinion the very important invocation what he says there is because both justice chandrachur and justice nariman recognize the fact that you've got this judgment it means nothing unless you use it to transform attitudes at the ground level and just as nariman's point is that he says that every state government and central government should take forward the principles embedded in the judgment and put give maximum publicity use to it using all media at their disposal the state government and the central government should should be conducting training programs especially to the police to ensure that these kinds of violent incidents don't happen again and that's where the the, the government has failed and we have not managed to put pressure on this government to take things forward but then i think that's the larger problem we are facing because we are seeing the fact that this government is hostile to human rights at every level and the hostility to rights trans, trans, translates even to the lgbt community you know in a, in a slightly different format by complete indifference and this indifference is what is not allowing us to make the progress in taking our struggle forward i'll just make one last point in terms of the way forward if you want to think of the way forward i think uh, i think we are at a very crucial time at this particular moment we can either decide to say that we are a part of a struggle with 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 which links to the feminist struggle links to the dalit struggle links to range of struggles in this country or we can say we are special 
We want nothing to do with these struggles whatsoever. And I wanted to refer specifically to an incident also feel very familiar with, which is the the uh, the invocation by the by the by the, by the Bombay police of the case of sedition against someone in the queer community in Bombay. Sedition is a criminal law. It's a law within the Indian Penal Code. It's a law of the same provenance of the IPC. It's meant to cut down or shut down dissent as it were. So, and moments like this are crucial. I'll just make the one last one and end up with one line, one last line. It's important because at this moment, if we say our future is an anti-discrimination law, we can't get to an anti-discrimination law without a coalition. That's my point. To build that coalition, we need to link up to the way other struggles are taking for the issue in terms of the opposition to the issue of the definition of sedition as a way of controlling freedoms in the broadest possible sense. Because our idea is to enhance human freedom, not lessen hum human freedom. Our idea is to take forward the issue of dignity. Our idea is to take forward the issue of equality. And to do that, we need to connect to a range of social movements. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate uh, you sharing that. We'll come back to some of the points you raised. But before that, I just want to go to Pallav Patankar, uh, who has been working with the corporate sector. And I see a lot of rainbow painted logos of corporate uh, companies post uh, Section 377 verdict, positive verdict in 2018. And are these corporates willing to walk the talk? You know, I mean, how has the things, uh, landscape on the corporate sector changed post uh, 377 verdict? So when I was with Hamsafar Trust, uh, I remember a particular situation where, you know, there were a few corporates who actually kind of walked the talk. And that was even when the Section 377 verdict was not read down. And even between the interim of 2013 to 2018. Uh, but most of them use Section 377 as an argument to stay out, you know, and uh, I feel what has happened post 2018 is yeah, I think everybody wants to take on the Section 377, uh, you know, route. It's a low-hanging fruit for a lot of them. But I don't think many understand the nuance of the diversity inclusion policies. Uh, some of them have had their journeys far ahead in terms of understanding what they should do and what they should, how they should involve uh, uh, LGBT uh, community members. However, I feel sometimes these are ticking the boxes which are there. They are not really heartfelt, uh, you know, or it's like they have a DNI manager who is meant, who's, who's, who's kept out there, who's supposed to do a particular, uh, you know, uh, DNI activity once in a year. And that's like a tick in the box again, whether it feeds into the policy of the organization, whether it feeds into the policy and it is accepted right up to the management level, uh, you don't really see that. Good organizations who are really making a difference is where the CEO or the top management are actually involved, are, yeah. have hands-on implementation, are actually, you know, ensuring that everything is, uh, you know, in line and it's truly felt. Uh, and, and I think there is another thing. Uh, having a DNI policy does not mean taking a DNI candidate or an LGBT candidate as a compromised candidate. Because that does disservice to the, uh, you know, the education as well as the competence of somebody who comes from the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. If I'm going to get employed uh, as, a, a, you know, as a lesser talented candidate because of my sexuality, as a community, we need to ask ourselves, is that what we want? Because then every time that I disclose my uh, sexuality within a workplace, the question is going to arise whether I am sitting out there because of the whole DNI compromise policy, and that's not what we want to perpetuate. What we want to actually have is an environment in corporate spaces where I have an equal uh, playing field, where I can move up, I can do my best, and I can have equal opportunity to move ahead if I wish to. And I think the third and the last, and I will probably end it with that, is uh, I even if Section 3, uh, 377 is gone, and uh, you know, uh, bullying is yet something that is and there, there 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 are ways that bullying cannot get even in western countries where you might have the most progressive laws you will have bullying at schools you will have bullying at workplaces and that yet exists at the workplace even today it can undermine a person's confidence a person's ability to work and an ability to move forward and i think those are the issues which are yet not uh, being addressed in the most effective manner within uh, you know uh, uh, corporate spaces one needs to understand that uh, having said that, Sridhar, I want to kind of make one more statement. When I see the whole film, 
you know uh, we need to understand uh, from the time some of us are in this moment maybe for 25 30 years whatever i think from the time that when we started working in 92 94 a large part of the moment was very much of what was the common minimum and what is the least that one could achieve you know mm-hmm. and i feel that as you see the moment spanning out in the recent stages i think individuality and what i feel becomes extremely important okay and i think there is bound to be conflict in the way we look at the moment whether we look at the moment collectively or whether we look at the moment uh, you know individually and uh, i i don't think the way ahead is going to be very easy for the community you know because i think un- unless we figure out what are the uh, common minimum agreements that we have to go forward otherwise we are going to be working against each other within this moment and situations like the sedition case in mumbai will continue to happen if we do not have level playing fields and we are not going to be you know hitting each each other because we are all eloquent and we are all have our politics which may be different the idea is what is the politics that works for all of us to move forward and i think that's extremely important at this uh, time uh, so uh, let's kind of recognize that and move okay there's a question here for uh, uh, pallav and ashok and vivek uh, how does this year's cancellation relocation of the pride march in mumbai mean for the community in the future how will it affect the community in the long term if the pride march and other expressions of pride keep getting affected by political changes in the country any of you want to answer that i think i have partly answered that so i won't answer it again okay Uh, yeah, he was he was part of the organizing committee so he knows the insides so uh, we we alla- what happened there a lot of us didn't know you know we were uh, far away when it happened so when it came up and became a police case and as arvin uh, says a sedition case it's very clear that we will not accept the sedition case you know but the point is what led to that was very unfortunate a person you see uh, pride e- even the delhi pride or uh, the calcutta pride they are highly structured they it's not an arcade you know there are structures there are there's a method of by which it goes and that is followed also in bombay obviously that structure was broken in bombay and we didn't know what is happening there is there are all sorts of charges being thrown around that uh, alleged right wing people uh, Uh, gave the name of that person you know to the and broke the confidentiality or whatever we didn't know at all we d- didn't even know who was who the person was what was the issue until we read the papers many of us were in the uh, you know uh, ignorant about it but the, but fact the question is, ashok uh, the no, question the, ashok uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, no i haven't finished yeah. the fact is you can't throw a uh, pallav under the bus you know and say that oh he didn't uh, he, uh, he was not with us he was a person who was going all the time to the police all the three of them saurabh uh, bondre and uh, pallav and all they were called about three times to the police they were held in police custody for four four hours each questioning and to me that was that was very very wrong where that time where was the solidarity and this uh, you know a, a unity of the movement we should have been with them too isn't The, we can't hear you uh, yeah so the, the, i i am i am a little worried about the way it's going that we we are going to try to be honest and get it all together again but i don't think we were dealt with very nicely you can't hit us on the face with something and say now you stand by us you have to tell us what exactly it is that you're talking about you get what i mean uh, I, i i would say that next year is going to be tough very tough because every year bombay had a set procedure by which the pride was organized and things like that there were uh, unlike delhi year you have to give an undertaking it has to be on the letterhead of the organization that is asking for the permission now let let's see what happens next year because i i'm, I'm i mean this year i'm a little uh, worried about it but i'm not uh, i'm not too worried because the younger lot is taking over that's it so vivek has a point here yeah. vivek unmute yourself unmute thank you ashok okay so uh, shri there are a couple of things there is one incident uh, with the trans kid and what happened to them uh, like the uh, once again the question uh, just to repeat the question uh, if you can yeah. just uh, 
the, what will happen if the governments fail to give permission to exactly uh, exactly yeah. so, so I mean, that's what I'm from coming the, from the post yeah so, so there was this post pride incident that happened i won't go there right. it is very simple that as hamsafar trust we had applied for permissions uh, we were called by the august kranti maidan police station and the police officer the head of the police station had repeatedly requested that how can five or six people represent the entire community we want larger number of people and pallav was very much part of that process saurav was very much part of that process when people were called up people did not show up for those meetings at the police station this was they clearly denied they said no we don't want to come there is this trouble there is that trouble now when police made an argument they said that just about a month ago there was a ca nrc protest and we had about 25000 people now you people say that you need a permission for 5000 people and now suddenly we know that this pride march is going to include anti ca anti nrc people and if suddenly 30000 people show up but you tell me that will be 5000 people as police department we get only x number of police officers to control to manage the pride if 30000 people show up how will we manage it we cannot say no to anti ca protest but you have to file a separate application for that okay but there was very little time that we couldn't file an application these are facts it has because we have been part of it it is documented with us they said that uh, under the circumstances we cannot give you permission and they did not deny the permission immediately they said we want you to come again tomorrow with more community people and pallav is here he can verify this second day again nine people showed up that's when the the police station the guy who was heading it he called his teams he handed over they said sorry we this year we cannot allow you to do it at august kranti maidan because it is something happened some untoward element comes in and tries to create trouble it could be from anyone it could be from the ruling government it could be from the opposition it could be some like you know uh, hate uh, people like you know who don't want to see us but if a crime happens if some violence breaks out in the walk who will be responsible for it mumbai police will be blamed for it it is mumbai police who will take all the flag so we request you to shift instead of pride parade we want you to do a solidarity event and you can go to azad maidan and in azad maidan we assure you that you will get your permission in 30 minutes time and they spoke to the azad maidan police station and when when we went there now hamsafar's request had been rejected and that is when the azad maidan police station says then who is going to apply for it and that is when these i think nine they came together again palla was one of those people they said they signed a bond they signed a bond and gave it to azad maidan and they said you can do anything you can do anti ca anti nrc whatever you want to do you are free to do and while we were at the pride uh, honestly for many of us what happened like ashok said it came to my notice 48 36 hours later we didn't know this had happened you know we really didn't know all this and for someone like me i don't live on social media and any of you know that i don't live i have work 24/7 i don't live on social media i was like quite surprised that what did this happen and then when video started coming out this was the post thing i would still say that in coming years let us strengthen it if there are times if the state has a problem and if you had 30000 people showing up the police would not have been able to manage it they wouldn't our our request was not for a pride of 30000 people let's let's get realistic let's get practical about the situation you know and and believe me they were very nice to everyone they were very respectful even during the solidarity event nobody was misbehaving i think in future also we need to be very careful anti ca anti nrc will not be part of the agenda of pride parade every year we need to see we need to work out that okay are we going to be 25000 people then apply for permission for 25000 people if you want to bring in anti ca anti nrc please 
apply for another permission for anti c anti nrt you can't say this is pride walk of lgbtq but in this we are including anti c no government needs you have to get get separate permission and i feel we need to follow some procedures and i believe that if we go the right way i think it may be a little tough but i'm very confident pride will be back as usual maybe even stronger so but just to reiterate my point okay. uh, and the last one uh, shridhar is that while there were protests about peep and uh, you know for ca nrc and you know whatever they were so we got as organizers we got beaten up by both sides by people who had issues about the protest happening and about people who were uh, who thought that we were anti the people uh, who were protesting so what happens to then queer organizing because if there are internal differences within the community and we don't agree on a particular political point of view any organizing at such a large scale will always have issues which will crop up and how do you deal with it who's right who's wrong and at that point in time as organizers we have to take a common minimum program where everyone says i was there at that pride march for pride solidarity i don't agree with your canrc stand and someone else will say i don't agree with your canrc stand how do you deal with that situation because those situations will arise much more in the future after section 377 reading down where our political view points will be very divergent and the way we look at things depending upon where we come from and let's accept that right now itself Yeah. I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, Arvind. Point. Yeah, I'm going to ask Arvind uh, uh, about this later. But I want to ask Simran, how has it been in Delhi? Uh, the pride, uh, what, I mean, in terms of permissions and everything, has it been okay? What is the situation in Delhi, Simran? In Delhi, the the permission process, as in terms, um, are a little complicated from the start. however the entire lgbt uh, spectrum who organize pride who organize protest who demonstrate who, uh, uh, recently we were protesting for the transgender bill um we did not face that much of um, problems as in say but of course with the shift place of jantar mantar now it has been shifted and they have thrown us back a little bit uh, with this place change and those dilemmas yes there has been a problem but as in such getting the permissions has not been that great um, issues a problem okay one of the attendees has said that like nandan has said parliament street police station has been very cooperative till now you know that's i think for uh, the delhi thing uh, arvin i want to ask you one of the questions by one second uh, 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 i just had one small point okay, okay go ahead vicky to make one point yeah. okay uh, i would like because i want to highlight this uh, when the august kranti maidan rejected the hamsafar trust application for the pride march okay we put this across that is there any other organization who would like to apply for the azad maidan permissions not one organization agreed there is some self questioning that needs to be done that why is it that you know it is hamsam and i was told that why don't you only go to azad maidan i said this organization provides services to 150000 individuals across the country it is how much of risk that i will take but what is the risk that you are willing to take no 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 it it eventually took nine individuals to come together to represent queer azad in mumbai and take that thing forward and do the solidarity march and if after that they are being abused or you know the i mean the kind of flack they took i just feel it was unfair and i am not at all defending that the arrest of a trans kid nobody agreed to that nobody was in favor of that but it is did these nine people deserve what they got how come they, i mean there there isn't a single organization apart from hamsafar trust that will come forward and apply what happened yeah people should take uh, ownership of the and moment ownership sure. yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, arvin there's a question here by jacqueline de silva how will the caa and nrc affect the lgbtq ia community yeah i think this in a sense links up to pallav's point quite obviously that uh, everybody won't agree with anybody everybody won't agree agree with everybody else anymore and that's quite clear because of the 377 not being that uniting factor as any more so i think the question is how do one move forward in a respectful manner uh, conscious of our differences right and that's one way to phrase it 
and on the see in a see point i guess the way to look at it is can i mean if you look at it from within the look at it more reasonably you say i mean can i make a reasonable case that lgbt people are affected by the ca and rc if i can make a reasonable case that lgbt people are affected by ca and rc then is it not our obligation to then allow people don't take that issue as part of the lgbt uh, uh, issue as well and i'll make it the I'll, i'll try and make a reasonable case this way making two 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 particular points one is that uh, the ca and rc requirement uh, especially the nrc is that everybody has to prove their citizenship to prove the citizenship you need a need a list of documents right and we all know how how important documents are in india and getting documents and what do you realize is that who it's most difficult to get documents are really those who are in a conflictual relationship with the families in assam in particular the ca and rc process came out very very strongly that if you were a woman who had a bad who let's take a lesbian woman who had a fall out with the family and in love living with a partner all her certificates documents etc with a family so if she has to prove citizenship today she has to go back to her family and get these documents from the family so the, the family it's the and idea of getting ca and rc is based on the fact that you have a good relationship with your family fundamentally if you're a transgender person again the fact that we know how difficult it is for transgender people to get that documentation again you're saying that you know if you don't have your documentation your citizenship could be marked as within courts doubtful and doubtful citizens then have to have go to the process of proving that they're citizens under the foreigners tribunal so it's a really complicated bureaucratic rigmarole in which they're putting the entire country through this process and the fact that this documentation requirement will affect a range of marginal communities including definitely transgender communities including definitely lgbt people who are in a conflictual relationship with their with, with their families so from that point of view you can make a case that one section of the lgbt community will definitely be affected by the ca and rc okay uh, similar wanted to say something i think arvind just said it um, i was wondering when he's going to say the word called transgender <laughs> and then he said it so thanks arvind <laughs> okay uh, pearl want to say something yeah i just wanted to uh, go back to the mumbai pride march uh, discussion that we were having uh, just uh, three things i wanted to say about that because i was a part of the organizing committee at that time i think the decision was taken first decision was taken in december that uh, we will include anti ca and rc as a part of mumbai pride march and uh, after not getting permissions and things like that going wrong i completely understand there were nine people at the police station but even after having nine people at the police station the police didn't talk to those nine people seven out of them were standing outside and only two were allowed inside to actually give it in the statement was given uh, lastly i think the community wasn't uh, flacking the organizers for uh, you know being harsh on the person but they were flacking them because they were either dead naming them or misgendering them which is still happening which is right now happening as well and i think that's what this community is not understanding that right now after the 377 judgment this lgbt has all broken up we are not standing together and we are not standing with each other and that's the biggest problem we are facing so just to yeah. correct out of those nine people eight people yet went to the police station it was not only two people who went in we went in at not at the same time but at different points of time and uh, i don't know what dead naming is it's a new term which has come in the last 3 months in my life so i'm yet learning and uh, as far as uh, the other things uh, i mean uh, nobody intended this individual also misbehaved and i have put that out very clearly on my social media handles i think it's your responsibility in a in, in, in a correct environment and on stage to have a certain way you deal with organizers and that was what was put out there and what is what has happened is happened the unfortunate part that happened later the sedition case being snap or whatever is unfortunate nobody wanted it nobody anticipated it but i also feel that there is a responsibility when leaders who are participating in such events how do they conduct with other people just the way i expect you know they they expect to be treated with respect they should also be treated with uh, people with respect now that now that they wish to take the uh, position of being the victim out here 
where where things are going against them but nobody sees what prompted them in the out there in the first place that's unfortunate and okay. that's totally smacking of yeah but all of outing them is not yeah, once again like arvind has a point they're not here to defend no they're they were not here in, to... in a, they were in an environment of 10000 people out there aspect. who's outing yeah. them you are going on doing public protest where is the question of outing come so okay okay we're going to stop this particular conversation at this point of time so basically uh, uh, i just want to cover pick up one part of the topic uh shobhna do you think the LGBT, lgbtq community is more fractured now shobhna yeah what we must acknowledge which we uh, fail to do is that people are different people will have 1.3 billion different perspective that is something that is there to stay we need to accept that we need to accept the differences in us um and not use that to actually you know call out people or or or, or be basically you know accusing them of things it doesn't really matter at the end of the day we are indians living in india we want better lives we want human rights we want all these things differences don't matter political differences don't matter at that point because we're fighting for the same thing the the advent of social media has made a lot of people arm arm chair um, activists and that is one of the things that i think somebody said here as well is that people do tend to talk a lot without taking the responsibility because to, if if i make a decision i need to take responsibility of the consequences as well as a community i think we have to learn that yes we are very still very young community at the moment in india a queer community uh, and in learning that any decision we make has consequences and we need to be responsible for that so i think we are still evolving and everything that happens happens for a reason um and we just need to plod along basically and respect differences that that i mean that's all i can say at the moment okay so uh, just answering two more questions uh, sorry answering two more questions. suhail has asked me whether i was uh, uh, basically envisaged that i'll be the narrator of them uh the way i uh, has me as a spokesperson uh, that is not envisage per se i kept uh, shooting the events and i kept shooting myself and somehow since i belong to the community and i've been part of the movement i felt that like i had to be part of that particular uh, uh, thing per se um the second question is like is there going to be a sequel to in three uh, so i don't know so definitely we need to trace what happened between 2013 and 2020 uh, for sure uh we need to look at that and uh, talk to the various stakeholders uh go back to arvind then go back to melika guruswami and try to understand what happened from 2013 to 2020 to 20 um so but like we are now sorry 8:30 so i'm going to just uh, basically close the session sagar you want to say something you've been very quiet no i've been listening it's uh, quite enriching to hear uh, everyone talking about uh, the issues uh, related with the lgbt community uh, so i think uh, it was like quite a uh, path breaking in uh, if i can say my, myself uh, yeah uh, and uh, yes uh, i think we should uh, sincerely consider uh, for a follow up uh, shridhar because what happened to all those uh, people who have been uh, interviewed here Uh, i'm talking about mainly about uh, those commoners uh, like who were directly affected by this law so if we can do a follow up story with them so that would be a something to uh, uh, know about further uh, and to uh, measure the uh, uh, impact of uh, reading down of peace and peace Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we need to go back to Madhumita, Chanakya, uh, all the people who are in the film and find out what the situation is now. You know. Uh, okay. Now we're going to have closing remarks by each of you uh, uh, because we are we are running out of time. So uh, closing remarks, Ashok. Just one uh, line or two uh, lines. Listening, listening to all the panelists and uh, even some of the attendees, I find that the uh, movement is still far too dispersed. Uh, there isn't a convergence of views, but as Shobhna said, that uh, 1.3 billion people will have 1.3 billion perspectives. So if we learn to respect these perspectives without being too vociferously toxic, I think we'll go ahead. Uh, it's a it's uh, the atmosphere, however bad it is, we must understand that we will fight. 
for, for, for what is correct and the, you know what is uh, uh, as far as human rights cannot be trampled upon and equality in the constitution so that's out of question so i think i see a lot of uh, optimism although the the dispersal and lack of convergence worries me but that'll come the younger people who are there i've taken over and i'm very happy that those uh, last year the the people who were hauled to uh, the police station and all held out on their own you know nobody broke like that ranks they were together and uh, even though they were the, everybody was not treated equally you know but all of us saw that they they did stick together you know so th there's there's hope there okay thank, thank you, you. Yeah. shobna any last words uh, you are to unmute yeah yeah ha huh. so i think taking the current situation in time of the covid 19 thing uh there is a bigger thing that's happening bigger than our life um and that is we've been given a reset button of and globally we are on a journey with the global population we need to set a reset button we cannot go back to how everything was normal or normal was or whatever normal was before so we must very consciously think about how we want to go forward and that is where somebody everybody has to introspect i think and that is you have people have to make individual decisions as to where to from here because this is a, a major major wake up call to all of us how we're going to be treating each other who is important to us what is important to us and how we live our life now so i mean that's all i can say at the moment yeah that's because that's what i'm doing right now thank you respect thank you arvind thank you sorry i couldn't hear you sorry <laughs> no, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Arvind, uh, maybe we just go back to the film, Shridhar. And I think any last we'll, words? Yeah. Go back to the film. Can you hear me? Yeah. Arvind, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 I said go back to the film, and I think of what really moved me this time around. You know, I saw the film again, and I, I thought the uh, the uh, yeah. when you covered the the voice of um, Jail uh, Pandian. in tamil nadu and spoke to the the sister that is very 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 moving you know when yeah. she was in tears at the time i'm so so glad that you got that voice out there and just to make the point i i, I don't know if you remembered it that the jayalakshmi case was one on justice shah was chief justice your comp yeah that's right i know your compensation to uh, to the yeah the, one lakh rupees that's right yeah which i think stayed by the supreme court the, the it's so frustrating right the government appeals that minimal amount of compensation and then it gets stayed by the supreme court and finally she's right she gets she gets nothing you know and just the only point is i think there'll be stories like that obviously if not in bigger cities in a lot of the smaller towns around you know and how do we keep our voices keep our ears attuned to these voices yeah no keep our ears you know and i'm so glad you you brought attention to these voices madhumita to uh, to uh, jai uh, to uh, to pandian as well as to and what pandian what a story right the family acceptance and it's very as a very beautiful very moving thank you actually for getting that out you know. so in fact like i mean I, I, apart from the politicization of the community we need to also look at the human stories you know uh, that's something hopefully will uh, yeah simran okay um so final comments from my end very quickly is a khichdi of uh, ashok rao kavi and shobhna and simplifying that khichdi uh, basically <laughs> i think according to <laughs> i think according thanks for actually showing this and it was a, a wonderful um, uh, thing to be seeing again it's a wonderful movie so thank you both the guys according to my lens the final word it what i i mean the final judge uh, way forward that i'm giving personally is i think the film has touched beyond lgbtqia initially we were just talking about lgbt lgbt now we have qia of course there will be difference of opinion but you know the essence the essence the community testimonials the the narratives that you have captured is so beautiful that it's really refreshing us and it really triggers that one thought in in, uh, in us that you know no matter what it is you know how much ever we fight like cats and dogs at the end of the day we are lgbtqia thank you sure okay, okay. uh abhivek 
Yeah, so Shida, first of all, thanks for the wonderful conversation. And I've been discussing this with you. Uh, Breaking Free sequel is due. <laughs> yes, totally. It's the journey from 2013 to 2018 because it ends in 2013. Uh, just a few small things. In 2007, Dr. Sujata Rao, who was the Director General of National AIDS Control Organization, had told Ashok that why should Global Fund support you? Yours is such a fractured community. Okay, but we still stood together. Uh, we are still evolving. We are still learning. And for me, Corona times, and especially Hamsafa's initiative, you know, Hamsafa fights COVID-19. It's such a learning moment. You know, there are kids who have gone out and donated 100 rupees, 500 rupees, 1,000 rupees. It means so much to us because there is this huge, huge LGBTI community outside. They are the most impacted, more largely, you know, to a very large level, the trans communities, they are really affected. Trans women, trans men, they are the most impacted. And the number of people, like this morning I was checking my log sheet, uh, the number of supporters have gone up to 408. Wow. And this list includes a lot of people with whom, like, you know, they would have differences either with Hamsafar or some issue. They have just come forward. They have given money to us. We are supporting, we are reaching out, we are sending out every fortnightly report trying to be as transparent as possible. And today I get that feeling. Every day I hear stories, you know, every day two, two, three stories coming out. And no, at this point, I don't feel community is fractured. Yes, there are some disappointments because uh, there were a lot of people who championed the cause of transgender communities. And I find them in a total mode of silence, not one word for trans communities, thousands of trans communities dying out there for hunger, not one word of support. But I also salute those hundreds of people, you know, the donor agency. Right now I have support for almost six corporates. They are coming forward. They are supporting us. We were giving financial aid. Then we moved into ration kits. We have reached out to more than 2000 people in the country and wow. have not been for the support of this 400 plus. And this 400 plus, gives me hope, makes me believe. I only have one thing to say, you know, in the end, that life is nothing like it's either my way or highway. Uh, we can walk together. We can agree to disagree. We can have our arguments. We can say, no, I don't agree with you. But still, we can walk together. We may fight in between. But when crisis happens, we will again come together. And when we are fighting for the rights of communities, then let us assume that everybody is community. You know, everybody under the queer umbrella is community. And I would urge taking this platform that more and more people, I'm surprised by the reaction of some of the corporates, they championed the cause of trans communities, pin drop silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm surprised by people who had differences with us just coming forward and making big donations. You know, right. individuals, not organizations. So it's it's an amazing learning moment. But I think we are again learning. And as Shobna said, once this COVID pandemic is over, we are going to walk into a new world. We not only need to respect the most impacted LGBTQ. I have a problem when you call someone migrant. Someone yes. who lived in Bombay for 30 years, you continue yes. to call that person a migrant. I have a problem with that term. And what are we going to do about it? Today, when they are moving out of Bombay, they say we'll never return to Bombay. We'll never return to Bangalore. It's time for us to rethink. We are lucky enough. I'm sitting in this room and talking to you all. But it's time to rethink, reassess our positions. But for me, the only way forward is we learn to have our differences. We learn to respect our differences. But we learn to assess that what our goal is and what we are fighting for. Okay, thanks a lot, Vivek. That's really uh, Pearl. Any last thoughts? Unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been roaming around the uh, house a lot. <laughs> sorry, I'm just, <laughs> just not a, so. Uh, I think one thing that uh, Vivek sir had told me once, and I, I truly believe in it, is that every time someone comes out to you saying that I have 
an issue with my identity or sexuality your movement starts right from there again and i believe in that even today so i just feel that even though we might not understand everything doesn't mean we stop respecting that and we need to stand by each other right now more than anyone else that's it okay good pallav so i when i saw breaking free i just realized the investment which has been made by different organizations in building leadership you know it within uh, the lgbt community and i think that uh, that effort needs to continue now it will happen that by virtue of generations our language our terminology our politics or even our sensibilities might change but there needs to be a process which needs to be put in place now what i may have believed strongly 25 years ago may not hold true now the instruments may be different because there was no social media 25 years ago and the way social media is used today is different however at the end of the day if there is no program on the ground you can be as woke as you want to on facebook twitter or instagram it's not going to make a difference in the real world so let us also build leadership you know uh, through the right means of making differences in people's lives uh, you know by doing the right things not just saying the right things all right thanks a lot really appreciate and this uh, session has been recorded we're going to put it up uh, unfortunately every is commenting that there's been no fine set all of the panel i think i just been a very gentle moderator so i thought i gave one <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So uh, I know there were some sparks from a painting, but I kind of uh, extinguished that. I'm sorry. So we're going to have a full more session of fights and everything next time. So thanks for being on this show for sure. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, showing more films uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so we might have Purple Skies next, Shobhna and Pearl. So perhaps oh. I'm going to invite you people to uh, come on board per se. uh and uh, be part of the panel uh coming up so thanks a lot for joining in ashok you want to say something no you're on the phone already okay all right bye 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 thanks a lot please leave the session thank you okay thanks, thanks to all the panelists and the attendees